So. Okay, Robin, I got one o'clock Eastern. Is it okay if I go ahead and get this party started? Hey, let's go ahead. All right, awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, if you're on the West Coast, I should say. And if you're watching this recording, I hope you're having a good day, no matter when and where you are. We are here to talk about keeping your donor, donor database healthy, wealthy, I should say wealthy and wise. Let me put that in there because I'm not even presenting, so I can, I can make it on the fly. <laughs> Basically, we're here to talk about dirty donor data and how to uh, prevent that. So you are in the right place if you care about this topic. Thanks for being here. I'm Steven. I'm over here at Bloomerang, and uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion, as always. And just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Just want to let you all know that we are recording this session, and I'll be sending out the recording as well as the slides later on today. I actually already have the slides, but if I missed you, don't worry, we will get that to you later on today. So if you have to leave early or maybe get interrupted, don't worry, we'll get all those goodies to you. Um, but most importantly, a lot of you already have already done it, but introduce yourself in the chat, ask questions as we go along. We're gonna have a Q and A session at the end. So don't be shy, we'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us how the weather is, what your organization does, anything fun you wanna tell us. You can also do that on Twitter. Uh, there's a Q and A tab. If you put your questions in the Q&A tab, they might not get lost in the shuffle as much as the chat, but we'll keep an eye on all those things. So bottom line is we'd, we'd love to hear from you. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, uh, welcome. We do these webinars every single Thursday. We love it. And uh, it's one of our favorite things we do here at Bloomerang. But if you've never heard of us beyond the webinars, or you're wondering what the heck is Bloomerang, we're actually a provider of donor management software. That's what Bloomerang is. It's a donor database. Uh, apropos to this topic, but uh, check it out if you're maybe interested in what we have to offer, or maybe you're thinking about switching. Um, but don't do that right now, because one of my favorites joining joining us from my hometown of New Bedford, Massachusetts, one of the many reasons why Robin and I get to get get along. Robin Cabral, how's it going? You doing okay? Hey, I'm doing just fine. This is awesome to have you. You've been uh, a stalwart on the uh, the webinars uh, for Bloom Rank for many years. And last time we had you, you were stuck in Australia. I was. The pandemic, yeah. true story. True but now story. you're back home, which I'm very, I'm very happy I'm for you because I was worried about home. you. Yeah. And it's not, it's not 2 a.m. or whatever time it was when you did the last <laughs> webinar. Yeah, the whaling museum in New Bedford. That's yes. right. The, the whaling capital of the world uh, at one point, right? Oh, hey, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Day. Okay, been to the whaling museum in New Good Bedford. Job, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. But cool. beyond uh, uh, being New Englanders, if, if y'all don't know Robin, um, dang, you got to check her out. She's been doing this a long time, over 25 years of experience. Helps a lot of organizations, including organizations in Australia. <laughs> Interesting little niche for her. Um, <laughs> great website resources. We'll connect all that stuff to you. And really is, is kind of our go-to for data cleanliness, data hygiene stuff. Oh, we've, yeah. we've collaborated on, on, some, on some content. She'll tell you about that. But anyway, I, people don't want to hear from me. I'm going to stop sharing, Robin. Why don't you uh, hey, all bring right. up let's, those beautiful slides? Let's see if I can uh, do this, right? Here we can go. You Beautiful. Hey. All right. Are we ready to rock All and right. roll or Take what? Take it away, my friend. <laughs> hey, I'm shy, so I'm going to shut off my video and then I'll bring it back on later. Okay. okay? Me too. All right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> awesome. All right, everyone. Well, this is my, I just love this topic. I call this garbage in is garbage out, right? Like how many of how many of you feel my pain? So as Stephen was saying, I live in New Bedford, Massachusetts and part time in Molly Mook Beach, New South Wales, Australia, curiously enough. So I own a company called uh, Development Consulting Solutions. I'm a certified fundraising executive and I have my master's in philanthropy and fund development from St. Mary's University of Minnesota. And I'm an MFIA. What the heck does that mean? A member of the Fundraising Institute of Australia. And shh, I have 27 years working for and with nonprofits. And, you know, I'm on a mission to transform organizations um, through effective philanthropy. And I work with clients throughout, obviously now throughout the world. Um, but the one universal global thing is that data, data is just bad, right? Like no matter where you go. Um, you are going, the first thing you're going to uh, run into is, uh, wow, just bad data. So this, this webinar is absolutely critical. So here's what we're going to go cover today. 
why clean data? Like those of you are probably like, duh, we already know this, but let's go over it because it's important uh, because you're going to have, have to advocate for dedicating some time within your organization to uh, cleaning up your data, right? So you got to make that case. Um, how do you structure your database? Like what should it look like? And um, how do you enter it in so that it stays the same from year to year to year, right? And how do we keep it clean? And then as Stephen suggested, we have collaborated on a while back now, um, a manual. It's a donor management software policies and procedures template that Bloomerang and I kind of co-created and worked on together. And so if Stephen hasn't made that available to you, he, I'm sure he can or I can as well. Um, and then I also threw in an article of mine that I wrote um, a little while back on um, how to keep your database clean and up to date. So why, why do we need, I mean, do I have to stress like, why do we need this case for consistent clean data? Why do we need it? Well, your database, I've said this, your database is like your brain, right? Like your fundraising brain. So, you know, it allows you to create reports around campaigns, appeals, events. You know, I have a webinar on um, doing a development audit and assessment. And you, in order to do an audit and assessment, you have to know what your baseline data is so that you can create some goals around that and then benchmark against those goals. So you need to be able to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. How many of you feel my pain out there? Just type into the chat box. Yes, right? Like, yes. All right. So identify loyal donors who may be prospects for major employment and giving i'm working on looking at uh, i'm actually doing a, uh, it, i serve as interim development staff for organizations yes i see them all and um so i'm working on developing a telemarketing program for monthly donor conversions for a group in australia and what am i doing i'm looking at the donor base for what recency and frequency so imagine if you had uh bad data right? That all would be off. So it, it determines strategy as well. How many of you? Yes, yes, yes. Keep the yeses coming if you feel my pain, right? So what if a database is too expensive? I say these days, it's never too expensive, right? Like, um, Bloomerang is a very, I'm not pushing Bloomerang, but it's a very cost affordable um, option. Um, there are lots of other software systems out there. So no longer do you have to pay like $20,000 to get Razor's Edge, right? Like you can have a database for, uh, you know, that fits your particular budget, right? So just Keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, they range. You can have the powerhouse to the basics, but I say don't use Excel because guess what? Excel is not a database. It's a spreadsheet. Yay. Right? So what, so, so products do exist out there, right? And uh, just remember that Excel is not a spreadsheet. It's, it's not a database. It's a spreadsheet. Okay. So now when I go into databases, what's the number one thing I look at? I look at how is it structured? The big internal structure. And that's when everything falls apart, right? Like, because then you see people have set up their campaigns wrong, their funds wrong, their appeals incorrectly, right? So there is um, a way to structure your database so that it is organized and consistent, right? And so these are my definitions and every database, these are just broad definitions. Every database, and maybe Stephen wants to type into the chat box, what Bloomerang uses to categorize these kinds of um, topical areas, but every database has the same kind of structure, but may call it differently. But campaigns, right? You have you have three things, campaigns, funds, and appeals, right? And so campaigns to me 
and Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, campaigns are like that broad general category. When I think of campaigns, you're running three or four different kinds of campaigns. You are running your annual campaign, you may be running a capital campaign, and or you may be running like an endowment campaign, or maybe even, you know, a, some kind of restricted gift campaign, right? And when you look at funds, we look at things like funds are like, um, to me, they're like these categories of restricted and unrestricted funds. And then you may have something like scholarship funds or the music uh, fund or something like that, right? So that's how I define campaigns and funds so make sure you have that clear and then what about appeals right so you may have something called appeals or activities or whatever and to me that's how you solicited the gift so what prompted this gift and appeals can be very specific things like your fall appeal your calendar year end appeal um it can be things like events it can be your spring auction it can be your golf tournament um hey right grants it could be your you know your grants category for 2021 right so those are when i look at it those are um kind of like how did you solicit the gift okay what prompted that gift so does everyone type into the chat box whether or not you kind of understand this campaign funds and appeals right i get it okay cool 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 making sense okay how many of you out there i love it oh my gosh you guys don't type so fast how many of you out there have your database like or came into your database and it was so not structured this way and you're going like omg like type into the chat box omg omg that was me yeah <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's a big OMG fest in there. Look at that. Oh, Janet's creating her database now. Okay, so now you get it, right, Janet? Campaigns, funds, and appeals. And Katie, too. It's awful. Everybody, oh, my. Wow. OMG. All right. So here we go. So when you're organizing your campaigns and appeals, Think about it, right? Where will this fundraising money be used, right? That's kind of like, is it annual? Is it capital? Is it unrestricted? Is it restricted? Um, and then funds should be categorized based on specific use, right? Like scholarship funds, restoration funds, unrestricted, unsolicited, grant, whatever. If, it, if a vendor appeal is reoccurring, include the fiscal year. So I'll do something like, you know, calendar year end appeal 2020, calendar year end appeal 2021, and make sure the naming conventions are consistent. How many of you went into your database when you first opened it up and went, uh, was that last year's calendar year end appeal? I don't know. Uh, that's how, oh, what about the year before? Maybe that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. I see this a lot. I mean, because I do interim fundraising for clients, um, I run their fundraising programs on a contract basis, right? So guess what? I'm in the database. Yikes. I feel the pain. So annual appeals, right? Don't lose your donors before they open the envelope. So some things you can do, right, is, is, you know, NCOA, national change of address on your database. You have to, number one, but do it regularly. Um, many mail houses and data systems. I don't know if Bloomerang, does Bloomerang do, do it, uh, does the NCOA for their clients? I'm not yep. sure. Every yep. night, every night. You every night. Oh, yeah. For free. <laughs> Holy moly, everybody. Look up Bloomerang now. Every night for free. So it's updating your data file with changes of address. I mean, that is gold right there. So you have the most up to date address for each of your contacts so you have that continuity of contact look at that check that out now 50 percent of people pay more attention 
to direct mail than to any other marketing channel. It is so obvious, right? That's why it is important to keep your addresses clean, right? So here's a great example of that. I, I go in and I look at clients who just use email and send out their email. And do you know what the average open rate is about? I don't know what it is statistically nationally, but for most of my clients, it's around 25%. So imagine only a quarter of the people that you're sending your email to, Amy, thank you, 23%, only a quarter are actually even opening it. Now, are they even paying attention to it? Who knows? But when you send a direct mail piece every afternoon at one o'clock, I just missed my one o'clock, I go to my mailbox. I've been doing it for what, you know, 30 years. Maybe even when I was a kid, I'd go walk out to my mailbox every day and get the mail for my parents, right? How many of you were like that? And you sift through the mail before you even start walking back to the door. We pay attention to our mail. That's why direct mail is still important and having correct information is absolutely critical. So nothing is worse than mailing to a donor who's passed away. So there's also something called and I don't know, Stephen, if Bloomerang checks this, the Social Security Death Index. That sounds bloody awful, doesn't it? But you don't want to be mailing to people that have exited this earthly sphere, right? We don't want to do that. So these are ways to keep your data clean and make sure that your envelope gets open. There are places that you can do research. You know, you can look up people in these different links, you know, or you get software systems like Bloomerang that do it nightly for it. And Stephen, it says nightly disease suppression. Holy cow. I don't know. You're selling me on this. <laughs> That's awesome. So other, so other times to remove a donor from a mailing list, okay? Sometimes, sometimes following a significant gift, but not all the time. The Veritas Group, if you don't subscribe to their blog, um, you should, because their blog is all about major gifts and they put together an awesome blog. You wanna subscribe to it because they say, yes, you should send your major donors your direct mail. Absolutely. Don't, the one thing that I'm famous for saying is, Veritas, Diane, don't make assumptions for your donors. Don't decide for them. Send them the mail. They're going to tell you they're going to send the gift or they're not. There you go. So following a large campaign pledge, sometimes uh, Stacy out there knows who I'm going to reference in a second, but working with a client who just is finishing up a large campaign. And when we have done their most recent direct mail pieces, we have suppressed from mailings um, large pledge donors who are in the middle of a very significant pledge. And of course, how many of you, or how many of you will admit, have forgotten to check off or, or exclude you know, the do not mails or do not solicit requests all the time? You need to do that. But how many of us forgot, have forgotten to do that? Right? Just put me, 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 me. Um, so me, I know. Me, I have. Me, I have done it. Okay. So these donors may be contacted, but in a very individual way and decide um, with, your, with your staff, your campaign cabinet, the best approach, meaning major gift donors, pledge donors, and other people. Like if they've unsubscribed from your newsletter, does that mean they don't want to be sent a direct mail? Well, that's another assumption, right? All right, so we kind of belabored that. But why, you know, how do we enter data so that it's utilized effectively? The number one thing that I see is no data consistency standards in databases. Um, it goes for how we enter data, when we enter data, how it's actually entered in, 
right? How many of you feel the pain on that one? Like street is sometimes spelled out and then you've got ST and then you've got a donor's last name in big capital letters, right? And their first name in small. And then you go to do a mailing and they're like, oh, gee, OMG, there it is. Oh, I got to fix this record, right? I see it irritates me. How many people does it irritate? Oh, it's a nightmare, isn't it? So it's your data, protect it, clean it up. Now, I get so cautious. I almost have, I'm Portuguese. Stephen knows we live in a very, Portu you know, a very highly uh, uh, descendants of Portugal here. So I'm going to say I get a niche. It's like I get like chest pains when I think, when I go into it, a, a, when I hear a client say to me, I'm giving all of our board members access to the database and they're going to go in and enter donor data. Or I'm just, I'm having one of these volunteers or a high school student come in and enter donor, donor data. And I'm like, oh, I'm the ish, right? So there should be one person who is trained and who is the person who does all of the donor data. And what we're hoping for um, is that it must be entered consistently and properly. So like Laura here is saying, doesn't NCOA end up capitalizing everything? It may, but I mean, consistently you determine if we're gonna keep capitalization, then we keep it for everyone. So our, our, our records all matter, right? Are all the same. Um, improperly entered data can cost us what? We all know this, right? Wasted time, lost efforts, all of those kinds of things, right? So a lot of vendors like Bloomerang, I get a monthly, um, a monthly, a weekly email. I think it's on Fridays with all the training that's available for the database, right? And so take advantage of that. Now, in some cases, you may have someone else who is cross-trained to enter the data right? Make sure that you indoctrinate them into your data consistency standards and you get that manual as part of this webinar. So make sure that you actually train them. They go through a training. And remember, maybe you want to um, actually have them sign off on a confidentiality form. How many of you actually do that, right? So make sure you remind them that donor information is highly confidential. Um, and for me, you know, board members or just volunteers out there that have not been trained, I should qualify that statement right there and say who have not been trained to enter data is inappropriate, right? Like do not set someone loose. It's like the person, you know, the cartoon, that's the whirly gig. I can't remember his name. It's like a tornado and he's going around in rooms, right? That's the same exact thing. When you let someone into your database, Taz, yes. Thank you, Amanda. When you let someone into your database and they've not been trained, how many of you feel like that, right? Um, or cringe when your executive director goes, just, just ask some of these high school students, right? That come to after school, OMG. Okay, so someone who's not a stakeholder may take costly shortcuts, right? I love that Tasmanian devil, that's Australian Tasman Tasmania. Oh my, oh my, so ensure consistency of that donor data entry. So have a procedure, we, Stephen Bloomerang and I are giving you a data consistency manual of sorts. How many of you out there have a data consistency manual right now? Yes or no? Type into the chat box. Nope. All right. After today, after today, you have one. Okay. You can't say nope anymore. All right. You're going to get one. They're going so fast, even the link just went right on my off and on my screen. Look at that. So set a standard procedure for data entry. Hey, if you want all caps, have all caps, but make sure the person entering in the data knows that. Make sure that you use proper salutations, right? Like, 
you know, make sure that informal is actually informal. What does that mean? Define it in your manual. What does a form formal salutation look like? Give examples in your manual, right? Primary addresses, check the postal processing requirements. Why do we say that? Someone said, what's the difference between street st and street there is because guess what the postal service the postal service will deliver mail quicker if you meet their processing requirements and standards so go online google how many of you have googled the, the postal service processing requirements and know what they are right and i believe in the Bloomerang manual we put together, it does say I did use those standards, okay? Bookmarked, okay, all right, yep, yep. So I see some of you are doing that. How many of you are not looking at the US Postal Service standards? That means that your mail is going to be sent faster and quicker, right? It's gonna meet those standards. So regularly update contact information, email addresses, and telephone numbers, right? So I'm going to give you some suggested reports that you can run on a weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, annual basis to do data checks. How many of you do um, regularly scheduled data checks of your, have some checks and balances in a system of reports for your database, right? Type in yes or no. So avoid nicknames. I don't like them. Use full names. Um, use fields provided for alternate names if you can for those nicknames. Um, and determine what data do you really, really need to keep? Wow, that seems overwhelming. Nope, nope. Now, there are folks that do data assessments. You can do a data assessment, right? You can print out your, your data file or you can look at it and get, a, get an assessment of the health of it overall. How many of you like did that on your first day and went, oh no, another one, right? It's not that hard to figure out how good data is or how bad it is, right? Like how many of you said that? Um, so, what would you like to know about your data? So there's a couple of things, right? Preferred method of contact, how often you want to contact them. And if they tell you, right, you better honor that. Um, you may want to know things like their volunteer interests, their history. Certainly you want to record all of this in your database. And most databases today can be customized, even though they come somewhat canned, there's lots of customization options available for them. So we need rules. Right, I know you're probably sitting there saying, I don't have time to develop these rules. But imagine, imagine, this is like Nirvana. You walk into an organization and they developed rules 10 years ago and they cleaned up all their data and they have a data standards manual and their volunteers and their staff who are using it are all cross-trained and the data is pristine. And you sit down at your desk and you're ready to go. How much time is that going to save you now, right? Like how many people are like, that's a Nirvana, right? Like I wish I had that. So things like, and this comes from the postals, um, the postal, some of this comes from the postal standards, USPS, USPS North is N, uh, oh, look at that, I have a spelling error too, like Stephen did. South, so, Southwest, Southwest becomes Southwest, right? Street types, this is the US Postal Service, um, should be Ave, Boulevard, Street, Avenue. You, you pick one, but use the postal regulation, and I believe it's ST and BLVD and AVE for postal, US Postal. Does anyone know offhand what that is? States of uh, postal requirements, look at that. Whoever put that in the chat box, there's the link to that. They should be, uh, you know, um, you know, you can write them out or you can use the abbreviations. Again, default to the postal requirements. The post office loves, loves, loves it. Um, when you use the zip plus four, 
as mush. Look at another spelling error. Oh, geez. Mush, as mush as possible. 00850-6641. How many of you like, oh, I know, but I hate looking it up. I hate looking it up. That's me. All right, I admit it. Okay, post office box should be P.O. box, you know, or P.O. box G, right? Like that's how they should be written. Someone put the link in. Look at this. Ah, U.S. Postal. Thank you, Amy. USPS says never use the period. Guess what? Because it's machines that read the mail and periods. Periods don't work too well with machines. Um, look at that. Lucille's given us some references. She's given us the USPS abbreviations and the zip code lookup. I should add that in here. That would be great, huh, Lucille? Cool, cool, cool. All right, so here are some other rules, abbreviate apartment to APT, SWEET, STE. These are all in that USPS Postal Service Regulations um, abbreviation. Schools and businesses should be written out in, you know, in full MSU versus Montclair, right? Or Montclair State University. Common prefixes, we all know those, but Sometimes we get confused, don't we? And as, as someone was saying, A-T-T-Y, no period for the postal service, doesn't like periods. Okay, and there's some common suffixes, okay? All right, now you all know my common suffix of M-F-I-A, quiz, what does it mean? Quick, someone type into the chat box, were you paying attention? Let's see, no Googling. All right, so some database databases actually have a notes field that you can track some um, some notes in, and um, and you can record things like interactions. Maybe you sent someone a note, or you made a call, or you sent them an email, and you can put in that person who who actually did that. Now, imagine Nirvana. Look at that, Laura. Uh, no, Anne, wrong. Um, Jessica, okay, cool. Yep, member of the Institute of Fundraisers of Australia. Kind of close. All right, you got it. All right, here we go. So once you have that data clean and we're in Nirvana sitting there going, wow, it's nice and clean now. How do we keep it clean? Well, number one, duplicate check. I have a client right now that has a different database system than the person who's, you know, the company that's hosting this. I won't mention the names. And um, they don't have a built-in email system. All right, so they have to interface, integrate with another email system and another landing page system and another this and a that. So what happens when someone goes online and enters a gift in on that landing page, that donate page, guess what? sometimes creates a duplicate in the data file, all right? Because it just doesn't integrate well. So duplicate checks on an ongoing basis, right? This online gift could trigger a duplicate, right? Um, accidents happen, right? So you don't want to be sending out, duplicates are so past, right? Like what are they, what's the saying when they say, Duplicates are like so passe, like they're so like history, right? Like these, these kinds of things, sending out two mailings should not be happening anymore. They just shouldn't, not with today's database systems. I hate should, I hate the word shouldn't, but it's true, right? We look really unprofessional when we're sending out the duplicates. So create, uh, queries and reports. Now, here's the other thing I'm going to throw in there, and I don't know if I have a slide, but I like to be impromptu. How many of you have gone into your queries and your reports and gone, what happened here? There's like 200 of them. How many of you, right? Like how many of you are like, Horace, <laughs> right? Like someone just created a query just to test something and they never deleted it. So clean up regularly, set a reminder on your calendar or something, right? To clean up your queries and your reports so that you don't have like 200 of them the next time you go in there, right? So here are some examples of queries that you can do. Things like people living in the same zip code, right? 
Um, you can do a query on those that came to the annual appeal, right? So I have actually been hired. Um, I created the Bloomerang template for a client and and pass it along. I was hired to go in and clean up their database. I was like the enforcer. It was so cool. And I went through and I just said to them, okay, what are the commonly run queries that you use? And what kinds of reports do you need on an ongoing basis? And we are going to get rid of everything else and just keep those. And so every so many months, quarterly, I'd go in and I'd check and wouldn't you know, lo and behold, there was more queries and more reports in the database. And what did I do? deleted them. I got rid of them. It was so liberating. It was so freeing to not have all of that stuff just hanging around. So here are some examples of reports that you should be looking at for data cleanliness. That's where we are right now. Okay. Data quality review monthly of all accounts created. So run a report of all the new accounts created or whatever you call your donors each month and check all of the data fields to make sure number one, that you're not missing something. And number two, that the data meets quality standards that you've defined. The other important thing is looking at expiration dates of credit cards, particularly those of you who have a robust or a growing monthly giving program. You want to do that monthly to stay on top of it. Do a duplicate report monthly, particularly if your systems, your email system is not integrated, right? You certainly want to do that. Then you want to look at, I know this seems like a lot, but if you create these reports to start off with, all you have to do is make yourself a reminder and press a button. Okay, simple as that. Transaction reports monthly. You want to examine campaigns, funds, and appeals. Are we keeping them consistent? Are we using the right ones? I have a client right now that emails out every day a donor transaction report of all of the transactions for the day. And everyone on the fundraising team can take a look at each transaction and make sure that they are co uh, coded accordingly. Which reminds me when I think about coding, how many of you have walked into a database and it has 6,000 constituent codes. How many of you? Like, that's the worst, right? So that's another thing. I don't know what you call it in your particular donor file. Clean those up to the bare bones minimum of constituent codes, okay? And look at security and account access yearly, if not more than that. How many of you, embarrassing, how many of you still have staff who left the organization or were terminated, still have access to your database, right? How many of you? How many of you put, not, uh, put yes or no? How many of you? Or have volunteers that have long since gone who still have access? How many of you have not checked your access? I'm looking. Last year, but okay, yes, someone defined live on. Ah, uh, not checked. How many of you have not checked your security access? Have not looked at it up to date? Okay, see, I've seen Sam on other webinars, haven't I, Sam? All right. Relationship reports for accuracy. Now they, yep, I knew it, Sam. All right, relationship reports for ac accuracy. Are the relationships the same? Hey, maybe someone got divorced and they're no longer husband and wife. How many of you update that on an ongoing basis, right? Out of date queries, we talked about that. And I would say reports as well that you're not using. Get rid of it. I'm like the Marie Kondo of databases. Get rid of the stuff you're not using, please. Look at it monthly. And keep up to date with the database training. It's a, if it's offered, 
look at it. I mean, stay up to date, right? Things are changing all the time in our databases. These companies like Bloomerang are making, they are listening to your feedback and they are making modifications to make your life easier, simple, and to boost your bottom line, fundraising results, retention results, all the key metrics. So stay up to date with it. Know what the new features are. Know what the best practices are. Subscribe to their blog or their newsletter, and um, and obviously stay up to date. Okay. So if you do not have that data entry manual, and I love to say on all my webinars, Sam will probably concur. I love to give stuff away, right? So you walk away from my webinars with a data consistency and a data standards manual like you can take it back and you don't have an excuse anymore to say i don't have one you have one so a database manual will allow you to create a standardized procedure for data entry right like you will have that and because you have it now and everybody's trained in it you're going to reduce those mistakes get rid of those duplicates and you'll be able to, because in your data manual, you should talk about how do we organize campaigns, appeals, and funds, and events, or whatever you call them. But you should document that organizational basic foundation structure for your database, right? And if I, this is a true story, I had a staff member that, I was going to say, if you have a staff member that gets hit by the bus, right? Like how many of us have used that saying? If you have a staff member that gets hit by the bus, someone else can just pick up the manual and walk into your database and know how to keep it clean, know how to enter in data, all of that, right? Well, I had a staff person who wasn't hit by a bus, but she tripped on the sidewalk and was out of work for three months. All right, and she was our data entry queen. Okay, right? All right, there you go. So having a manual is important. I love that. If one of my staff won the lottery and left, hopefully they wouldn't win the lottery and leave. Hopefully they win the lottery and stay because they love working for you so much because you're the best boss and they would donate some of that back. All right, so this, this database manual provides a clear outline for your organization, things like, and it should include things like, you'll see the data template, profile management, transaction management, interaction man management, and uh, report management. Those are the main categories that um, your data manual should have. Um, and profile management is all about how we enter data consistently, how we avoid duplication, and how we regulate that donor en entry. The transaction manual portion of the manual should be about like how we enter funds, how we structure campaigns and appeals. So that way, when you're looking for information, when you need it, you can find it. And then there's a section called report management. And that section should outline things like giving history, event history, donor interaction, and uh, next steps. And then there is the interaction management that, that outlines gift acknowledgements, online gift management, letter templates, contacts, all those kinds of things, right? So um, actually, I'm not sure if I, I actually have to look at that manual. Don't remember, Stephen, if it includes um, a section on policies and procedures. So yes, it does, it does. All right, so you should also, in addition to having a manual, how many of you actually have a, a processing, a gift processing policy? Like it outlines step-by-step step when a gift enters in, it goes first to the receptionist who opens up the mail, date stamps it and does all that stuff. Then it routes itself to finance. And then from there, she makes two copies and sends it on to development who then that enters, you know, whatever that policy might be. And then, nope, nope, I'm seeing some of you that say, 
Ah, uh, it's being tracked together. Now we're on the right track. Yes, this procedure is so important, right? Okay, anyone else? We have it in our development office policies. Okay, nope, okay, all right. How about, nope, okay. How about a gift reconciliation procedure? How many of you, in some database systems now, can talk to data and um, accounting systems, can interface and talk with each other. But how many of you make sure that you do some kind of reconciliation on an ongoing basis? Yes, Leanne, they do that with their finance. Because guess what? The board, the board of direction, directors, you know those people, they don't care what the development numbers say. Oops, did I say that? You know whose numbers they look at at the board meeting? They look at the finance numbers, right? What number is it king to the board? The finance numbers, right? So, right, how many of you? So your numbers, um, bottom line numbers, my friend, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, right? How many of you make sure that your numbers and finances numbers reconcile, right? That's absolutely critical. So making sure that you do some kind of ongoing monthly reconciliation of your donor database is absolutely critical. And don't wait for six months. You know how much of a bear that process that is to find gifts six months later is when you're like five pennies off? Do you know how difficult that is, right? Six months later worth of gifts. OMG. So do that monthly. Have some kind of process in place monthly. So wow, we have like 10 minutes left. Um, actually, do you have a Leanne saying, do you have a successful procedure to teach finance and in fund development pledges count? Uh, I might have a gift acceptance policy with something in it about pledges somewhere is in my brain. So here's, I hope, what you learned. Like, how many of you learned something in this webinar, right? Like, um, ensure consistently clean data in a professional data system. We recognize that they are very inexpensive these days, so that's no excuse. Um, how many of you are going to go back to your department and say, hey, Excel is not a database, right? Just put quotations from Robin. Um, organize your campaigns and appeals and why, right? Like why is that structure so critical? So like that's the first step. You've got to get that backbone. I call it the skeleton of your database in place first. Campaigns, appeals, and funds or campaigns, funds, and appeals. And then you need to enter in your data consistently. You know, if it's ST, make sure it's ST. And, and use the postal service, because guess what? We want our mail zipping along, especially at Christmas and the holiday time, calendar year end when everybody's in the mail stream. All right. And then having some ongoing reporting um, and, and, and keeping that data clean. So having cleanliness reporting and then the importance of, and you don't have to think too hard because you get the manual. So, you know, just thank us all. You get that data entry manual. So with that, um, how will you use this information? Um, emotional and informational lecture. Do you know why I'm so emotional about this? Because every single client, almost, I have yet to find in my life, if I find one, if I find one database that I go into and it's clean, I will retire tomorrow. I will retire the next day. All right. It's like winning the lottery. It's like that difficult, right? Like how many of you feel like being like it is like winning the lottery, right? Like, so I will retire the next day. I will be in Nirvana, database Nirvana. So, all right, I'm going to call Stephen back on and see if we have any questions that I can answer. And um, and uh, let's see. And if anyone doesn't have any questions, if they want to share what they're going to put in place immediately, 
And here I am. Look at that. I took off my hey. jacket and it got so yeah, you're sweaty. You're getting fired up. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> It's getting hot. Just listen to it too. Thanks, yeah. Robin. That was awesome. And don't worry, folks. We have Robin on every year. I, I would not, I would not let a year go by with that without her. She's got to, she's got to have one of those fifty spots or whatever. Uh, right. Robin, that was awesome. Thank you. You're speaking my language. Obviously, I'm kind of a database guy. Yeah. In case folks didn't know that already. But um, listen, if you don't use Bloomerang, that's cool. You can still do all this stuff, and you should. Um, no problem. But grab that free manual. I've put it in the chat a bunch of times. It is vendor agnostic. Uh, you just, if you're on Neon, ETAP, Razor's Edge, Donor Perfect, you can use that. And if you download it, by the way, we don't ask for your email address, so we won't bug you. It's not a trick or anything. We just, we just love you all very much. So download it. Um, Robin, we got a lot of questions. One of my favorites just popped up in here. How long do you keep data? Are you a, are you a fan of deleting old data? I, you know, I'm not. And here's my, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of making it inactive. But like, you know, I've worked in so many places that we get a $250,000 bequest some one day mm -hmm. and we were like, who was Mrs. Smith, right? And we can go back to the gift history and, and, and realize Mrs. Smith in 2006 gave $10 once, right? So we have that historical. What I'm a fan of is using data as try to do like a warm acquisition or re-engagement strategy. So if people haven't given in a number of you know, years or what have you, you know, I'm a fan of let's try to re-engage them and, uh, and try, try to use some techniques around that. And then if we can't re-engage them, then maybe put them into an inactive or tag, tag them in as inactive and don't mail to them at all or infrequently, right? Like maybe just once a year, what have you. So using different strategies around that. Um, I'm right with you. A lot of these databases, Bloomery included, you can just mark someone as inactive. Yeah. Stay in there. That's yeah. nice. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of a lot of the, the programs charge by how many people you have. In the yeah. Database. It can be yeah. tempting. And you're gonna think I'm biased, but because I work at one. But again, you never know when. Yeah, you, you just data. you just never mm -hmm. know. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. Particularly, alum someone was just saying, "How about old alumni?" Well, I'm like, I don't know. Wouldn't you use alumni list for other things as well, right? Like, I don't know what they're using their CRM for, but I would keep them in there. You'd want to know who are your alumni. Um, when they're the same uh, CRM. Okay, so there's a specific Bloomerang question. Yeah, Bloomerang um, questions I'll, I'll handle because uh, yeah, yeah. other people probably don't care if there it is Bloomerang. Yeah. Uh, but here's a good one. What do you think about honorariums, Robin? You know, Mr. Yeah. Mrs. Uh, MX, I've, I've seen. It seems like if you're not real confident in someone's gender identity, that maybe that can be potential pitfall to use those? What do you think? Robin? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? So yeah, uh, the worst thing that you could do is get someone's, there's two things, right? Well, three things, four <laughs> things. You can send mail to people that have earth, left this earthly sphere, as I call it, deceased. Um, you can send people who do not want mail and you send it to them. You can send people with their name incorrectly, or like if you decided to, you know, abbreviate their first name from Alexandria to Alex, and you know they prefer Alexandria, boo boo, right? And then right. you know getting someone's gender wrong, right? Like mm -hmm. that happens to me because Robin in some countries like Australia, um, England, mm -hmm. Robin is a name for a male. So I will often get addressed as he or him or, you know, so, um, so yeah, I think that's just, no, I'm a woman, right? Like, let's get that, let's get that right. Uh, Mr. Getting rid of the Mr. and Mrs. Salutation. Yeah, that goes to what is your formal, what is your informal salutations, right? And I prefer if we're talking to friends and our donors are our friends, that we use informal, like, you know, dear Bob and Jane, right? Um, no prefixes. Look at that. People are just answering. I can't keep up. <laughs> what other right. questions? That's Bloomer and Cooter are telling you they're good. Yeah. Singular they for everyone. Singular they for everyone. 
not getting does the post office do well with a name on two lines like some couples need in mailing labels you may want to check the postal regis, regis, regulations i mean they have them all right online because guess what they want you to make their job easy. So go to the post office. People have been posting that link. Someone else want to post it for folks again, USPS, and just look at the postal um, standards that they require for mail. Um, anyone else have questions? Yeah, there's a couple in here, Robin. Probably got time for one more. And if we if we didn't get to you, Robin, how can folks reach out to you? I'm oh, sure. sure. Let's just see here. Oh, there um, you go. Cool. There is my website, my email address. Wow, that's really bright blue, isn't it? My phone number, and um, I have a Twitter account, and LinkedIn, and a Facebook, and yada 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 yada. Yeah, great Facebook group, by oh, the way. Oh, someone, um, okay, someone's in it. Not, it's the Nonprofit Survive. And this was pre-pandemic, folks. This was in 2018, I think I developed this Facebook group. Nonprofit Survive and Thrive Facebook group. Did, Jenny, did you learn about the webinar in the Facebook group? Um, so yeah, it's a Nonprofit Survive and thrive. That was pre-pandemic. So I bet you a lot of people during the pandemic went for that name and went, ah, that Robin, she got it. All right, what, what's the question? Sorry about um, that. Appeal codes. What's your take? Is it separate appeal codes every time? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, I don't have a, a, a set thing on appeal codes because um, I really think you need to develop a standard for things. Mm -hmm. And whatever that standard is, be consistent, right? So if it's going to be spring, spring appeal 21, SPR 21, then make sure spring appeal 22 is SPR 22. So have some kind of naming conventions, but make them consistent. Does that make sense? Yep. No um, matter what your format is, as long as yeah, it's consistent. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've seen, you know, spring appeal spelled out 21, you know, whatever that is, just make sure that it's consistent. That's a pet peeve of mine is inconsistencies in data. Anything well, else? We're almost out of time. Um, I know a lot of uh, you know, I, I don't want to keep people too long, but reach out to Robin if we didn't get to your question and reach out to me if you are a Bloomerang user with very Bloomerang specific questions. I was trying to keep up with them in the chat, but if I missed you, just email me or reply to the email that you're going to get from me in a couple yeah. hours with the recording and the slides. You'll see that. Um, cool. And um, Robin, this was awesome to have you. Thanks, hey, thanks for doing this so once again. Good to be back and such an important topic that. Yeah. I am like super passionate about because I'm in, as I say, I'm in databases every single day. And <laughs> doesn't matter if it's Bloomerang, Donor Perfect Network for Good, Little Green Light. Yep. It's the same problems over and over and over again. So yeah, Funny so yeah, it's like a pet peeve. So thank you for having me back, Stephen. And hopefully you, you'll get to New Bedford soon. New Bedford. I, I need to. And and now that you're back in the States, I'm, I'm also happy for that you're not stranded there. Although I know Australia is very lovely. Um, it is. So thanks for doing it. And thanks to all of you for hanging out. Uh, I know you're probably busy. Maybe you're wrapping up your fiscal year. So everybody appreciates seeing a full room. We got one more webinar uh, before the the kind of the mid year point of the year. We're going to finish strong with our buddy Crystal Frazier. Cool. She's talking about email, social media, some digital communications. Give me a good cool. one. I think it'll cool. help you with your uh, second half of the year. So be there next Thursday at noon Eastern. Bring a sandwich, bring a bowl of soup or a salad or uh, some some sushi takeout. Grab grab some lunch and hang out with us and probably breakfast if you're on the West Coast. That's cool too. Um, but look for an email from me with the recording and the slides. We'll get all that good stuff to you later today and hopefully see you next week. So have a good rest of your Thursday. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Stay cool. Watch out for those storms. There's some storms brewing. So uh, be careful out there. Wow. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now. All right. Make it a good see day. Ya. See you later.